All right, so then our next talk is going to be Sheila Sundaram. Uh, who will be telling us about the Immaculate Hekaposa. Take it away, Sheila. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful conference and for inviting me to be part of it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, work that I did in this joint algebraic combinatorics research community project. And my co-authors are Elizabeth Nies, Stephanie Van Willigenberg, Julianne Vega, and Xi Yun Wang. Okay, so the star of this talk is going to be this POSET, which I reproduced here. But before I tell you all the things that I think are amazing about it, I have to tell you some background. Uh, so instead of partitions, which we've seen a lot of in this, in this conference, I'm gonna be talking mostly about compositions. So a composition is just a, of N, is just a sequence of positive integers that adds up to N. And uh, the diagram is, for, for me, it's going to be left justified. And row one is going to be the bottom row. So this is what you call French notation. I like to think of it as Cartesian style. Uh, this was a huge adjustment for me a few months ago because I grew up on Ferrer's diagrams with the longest row on top. So, and I tend to be dyslexic. So this was a real challenge. Uh, okay, so um, the other thing is, oh, I forgot about this annoying thing. I, I can't see the title of my, my slide because the Zoom thing is up there. Um, but anyway, uh, the other thing that was hard to get used to, and if you're seeing this for the first time, you might have the same experience, is this definition of standard immaculate tableau, where your, all the rows increase from left to right, but the restriction is only on the leftmost column, only on one column. This was really, really weird for me the first time I saw it. So this, this is a standard immaculate tableau. So standard just says it's filled with distinct entries from one to N. And it was defined by uh, Berg, Bergeron, Saliola, Serrano, and Zabro Oops, Zabraki, <laughs> sorry. Um, and what they were trying to do was construct a non-commutative version of short functions. So this is how this came up. So here's an example here. Uh, first column is strictly increasing. The other columns can do anything they want, but the rows always have to be increasing. Right? OK, so just so that I can get to my post-set, right, my favorite object in this talk right away, I'm going to so sort of give you a, a very quick preview of what's coming. So one of the things we had to do was define what I'm calling the RS star descent set on these standard immaculate tableau. Um, and so I is a descent if I plus one appears weakly below I. And the main point here is that this is going to define a partial order on the set of standard immaculate tableau where S precedes T if you can get T just by switching I and I plus one. Oops, so here it is, right? Okay, so we can, we can look at, this is the, uh, look, the smallest example that I could actually find that was meaningful. So if you look at the standard immaculate tab tableau that I've drawn on the bottom, according to my definition, three is a descent because four is weakly below it, uh, and four is a descent because five is also below it. I can switch the four and the five. I can't switch the three and the four because that would produce a tableau that violates the row increasing condition. So I'm not allowed to do that. But anyway, so you move up this poset like this. This is all the standard immaculate tableau. Uh, ignore the pies for a second. They're coming from the zero Hecke algebra, which I haven't got to yet. But the, the things that I've, the tableau that I've highlighted in, in blue and in red are the ones that are important to focus on because each one of them generates um, an order ideal or an order filter in this poset. And the order ideal gives you a submodule and the order filter gives you a quotient module. So the, a large portion of this work is devoted to showing that the resulting submodules are quotient modules are cyclic and indecomposable. Okay. All right, so I have to talk about 
compositions again. So compositions map to subsets, right? In the obvious way, this is probably an exercise in EC1 somewhere, right? So there are two to the n minus one compositions of n. And refinement, so a composition beta refines a composition alpha. If you can get beta, so if you look here, I, I hope you can see my cursor. If you can get beta from alpha by taking a part of alpha and breaking it up into another composition, right? So that's refinement. Quasi-symmetric functions, so they're the other things that figure prominently in in the literature here. Uh, I am not very familiar with this literature because I've like literally learned all this in the last few months. So <laughs> there are probably experts in the audience here. But anyway, quasi-symmetric, what does that mean? Well, that just means that for every sequence of exponents, alpha one through alpha k, and every increasing sequence of subscripts, the coefficient of this monomial, x1 to the alpha one, x2 to the alpha two, and so on, is the same as the coefficient of x i1 to the alpha 1, x i2 to the alpha 2, so on. So quick example, this function in blue is quasi-symmetric, x1 squared x2, x1 squared x3. So I can put 2 and 1 in order on, on the variables, but I, it's not symmetric because I don't have an x1, x2 squared. That would be out of, I would be doing it out of order for the variables. So the set of all quasi-symmetric functions gives you an algebra that's graded by degree, and the degree n piece is a vector space of dimension 2 to the n minus 1, the number of compositions. It has two very nice, easy bases. One of them is the monomial quasi-symmetric function indexed by the composition alpha. So that just means you take the composition alpha and write down all the monomials that you can stick alpha on as powers. And then the second one that's more interesting because it has a representation theoretic significance is the fundamental quasi-symmetric function. And I'm going to define it this way, F subscript alpha is the sum over all compositions beta that refine alpha of the monomials. Um, so the, the nice thing about defining it this way is that you immediately, well, you think about it for a second or two, and you realize that you've got an upper triangular matrix. So if the monomials are a basis, the fundamental symmetric, quasi-symmetric functions are also. So here are examples, right? And as I said, uh, they're both bases, the monomial basis and the fundamental basis. Okay, so there's a more sophisticated basis. Um, this, this, again, was originally defined by Berg and co-authors, the dual immaculate basis. Uh, so what are they doing here? They're basically taking this, the definition I gave you of standard immaculate tableau and making it semi-standard by allowing repeated entries, but you still have to require that the leftmost column increases strictly bottom to top. And the rows always increase weakly left to right. And then you make a generating function out of them, and they call that the dual immaculate function. So I've got a math frac S here, S subscript alpha with a star for dual. Um, so this is a quasi-symmetric function. You can show that it's a quasi-symmetric function, and you can show that it's a basis uh, for the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. And here's an example. So is it, is it clear what I'm doing? Um, so this is just the usual way that you take semi-standard tableau and, you know, get the sure function out of them. You're weighting it by this one would give you x1, x2 squared. This one would give you x1, x2, x3, x1, x3 squared, and so on, right? Okay. Um, so the starting point for this project was actually uh, Elizabeth Niece came up with this variant of what they did. Um, so this is the definition of row strict immaculate tableau. So you, what you're doing is you're just swapping weakly increasing and strictly increasing. So now you want to um, require that the leftmost column increases weakly, but the rows increase strictly, right? Um, so it's so it's sort of like applying omega in the ring of symmetric functions if you think about what that would do except your restriction is only on one column. 
All right, so again, if you make a generating function out of these row strict immaculate tableau, um, you get a quasi-symmetric function and it turns out to be a basis for the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. And these two are related. They're related by the involution psi on the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. Uh, so what does psi do? It sends the fundamental uh, quasi-symmetric function index by alpha to the fundamental index by alpha complement, where alpha complement, you're not really complementing the compositions themselves. That sort of doesn't make sense. You're complementing the sets associated to the comp the compositions. Uh, so if you've never seen this before, just, you know, this is just some involution that maps one of these things to the other. And it relates to the omega that uh, Antonio Negro just talked about. In fact, it restricts to it, right? In the ring of symmetric functions, psi is just the involution omega. All right, so just, just to um, put everything together here that I, that I just said, uh, what Berg and his co-authors did was to define a sigma star descent set. So that's the set of all i's in the standard tableau where i plus one appears strictly above i. And what we're doing is looking at an rs star descent set, which where i plus one appears weakly below i. Right? And the descent sets are important because they allow you to um, write your quasi-symmetric function in terms of the fundamental basis, right? And in fact, that's one way of telling that you have a quasi-symmetric function, okay? So here's a table that shows you everything. Uh, the sure functions are in this column, you, the, the ones that people should are probably familiar with. Um, the Berg uh, and his co-authors define the dual immaculate functions. And here's our new row strict dual immaculate functions. And I wrote out the, the ex fundamental expansions on the bottom just so that you can see that they're all different, right? So the sure functions, of course, give you a basis for the ring of symmetric functions. The other two give you bases for the quasi-symmetric functions. They're two distinct bases. Okay, the zero Hecke algebra, what's this? Uh, well, you can think of it as a deformation of the group algebra of the symmetric group. Um, so the, the, you have the braid relations here. I think we saw this, Bridget wrote these out in her talk. So instead of simple reflections, we have pi i squared equal to pi i, not the identity. That's really the only difference, right? So they're idempotents rather than involutions. Um, so it has dimension n factorial. It has a basis that's indexed by permutations of the symmetric group, Sn. And pi subscript sigma is pi i1, is the product pi i1 through pi i m, if you've got a reduced word expression for the permutation sigma. The, but the important thing here is that there's a very simple description of <laughs> the simple modules, the irreducible modules, right, due to Pamela Norton. And she showed that there are exactly two to the n minus one simple modules, L subscript alpha. There's one for each composition alpha, and they're all one dimensional. Okay. Um, let's see. So, and the other thing, so what's the connection with quasi symmetric functions? So I, I put something on the bottom that's a little more precise, but basically to every finite dimensional zero Hecke module, you can associate a quasi-symmetric function that comes up as a sum of fundamental quasi-symmetric functions indexed by compositions that are uniquely determined by your module. So this is the connection for combinatorialists, I think, again, I'm not very familiar with the history and the literature, but I think this was sort of the starting point or spark for the algebraic combinatorics community to get interested in the zero Hecke algebra. All right, so how do you construct modules for the zero Hecke algebra? So as far as I can tell, the sort of model seems to be this. You've got some set of standard tableau um, and you've got some notion of descent set defined on these tableau. And Si of t is um, the operator that switches i and i plus one. 
Um, so you define the action of the generator as follows, T if I is not a descent, SI of T if I is a descent and something else happens and zero otherwise. So that star represents the suitable con conditions that guarantee that these generators will satisfy the Hecke relations. And so you get a Hecke module whose basis has this set of standard tableau that you started with. So this, these happy conditions happen for the S star descent set and for the R S star descent set. Okay, so the POSET finally. So the POSET is defined on the standard immaculate tableau. And so now I have, because I have two descent sets, I technically have two order relations, but I want to, what I want, what I'm trying to show you in this slide is that, or what I'm trying to say is that they're actually both the same POSET. One is basically the dual of the other. So um, S precedes T in the immaculate POSET if you can get, if S is equal to pi I applied to T. And in our row strict immaculate poset, S precedes T. If you can get T by applying pi I to S, the, the, the two actions are different. There's a technical difference between the two actions that is, <laughs> well, it's, it's technical. So all, all the details of the proofs are completely different and technical. So the lemma is, as I said, that these, these two relations really define the same poset. And I'm calling the one, the one in magenta here, the immaculate Hecke poset. So here's a bigger example. Uh, so the arrows, let's see, maybe we can focus on this one that's right below the magenta one. Um, so I have, three, which remember, so for me, for row strict, the descent, I is a descent if I plus one is below it or weakly below it. So four is weakly below three, so I can apply a pi three, which is just this, whoops, sorry, which is just the switch, right? So it goes to this one, or I can apply pi four because four is a descent, and then I go to the magenta one, right? So there's my poset. Um, so, okay, so let's see, what did I mean to say here? All right, so there are some key technical algorithms that I'm calling straightening algorithms. So we can show that this poset is ranked, that it has a unique bottom element and a unique top element. And you can show, you can explicitly construct saturated chains from the bottom element to any tableau T and from T to the top element. So these things, the straightening algorithm that I probably don't have time to show you is important in order to show that the modules are uh, in decomposable. Okay, um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, so I think I'm going to skip this slide. All right. you, have, you have some more time, Sheila, because uh, we started about five minutes late. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we know how many, we know the size of this poset. Um, Derek and his co-authors actually gave us a, a nice formula. Uh, and we also know what the rank is. So this table just shows you that they grow very fast. Uh, so the first one I showed you is the one that had rank four. And this one that I'm going to be working on, my working example, has 24 elements in rank eight. The next one is actually a little more interesting, but it had 36 elements and I just couldn't see how to fit them all on the screen. So, <laughs> um, okay, so here we go. All right, so what is our theorem? Our theorem is that the minimal element actually generates an indecomposable module for the whole, if you like, the vector space spanned by all 24 of these things. It's the zero Hecke module for the R S star action. So its quasi-symmetric characteristic is the row strict dual immaculate function. If you reverse the arrows, you get Berg, Bergeron, et al's original um, dual immaculate action. And the, row, the super standard tableau is what 
generate that module. Okay. And again, our, the straightening algorithms that uh, uh, we have show that they're indecomposable. Okay. okay, so you get uh, both of these things from this post set. Their proof, their original proof for the S star action was quite different. All right. Um, so this is just all, all that said formally. But there's there's more that you can tell from this post set if we look at it. So I'm going to let uh, SET of alpha be the set of tableau where all the columns are increasing. So now this should start to sound a little more familiar. So in particular, if my composition were a partition, that is, if my if my rows were uh, <laughs> decreasing from bottom to top, then it would be an actual partition. Then I'm looking at standard Young tableau, right? Okay. So this set in, in this picture, in, um, it's the magenta and red ones. There's a reason why this thing came out to be magenta, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so this is the column superstandard tableau. So what do I mean by that? I'm just filling the columns left to right, bottom to right consecutively with the integers, right? And so it generates an indecomposable submodule for our uh, row strict immaculate action. And then if you reverse the arrows, so let's see what happens if you reverse the arrows. If you reverse the, oh, so sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You can see that in the post set because if you start with this element, you only go to something that has all columns increasing. So that's what tells you that you have an invariant submodule here, right? So you can actually see that in the post set. If you reverse the arrows, the opposite happens. Everything that I left out is invariant under the S star action. That's not something that I can describe from the representation theoretic point of view. I can't describe that very easily. But if I mod out by it, then I get a quotient module that has exactly the same basis, all tableau that have all the columns increasing. So the quotient module has the same basis for the S star action. Okay, so this is the theorem. Um, we can show that this set where all the columns are uh, increasing is closed under my row strict action. Um, it's an interval in the post set. It spans an indeco indecomposable cyclic module, right? It's generated by the column superstandard tableau. And I'm going to say more about its um, quasi-symmetric characteristic because that's combinatorially very interesting. So here's the part about the quotient module. Right. So um, the thing, so again, this is the thing that I tried to point out. If you look at what I'm calling R E subscript alpha, when alpha is a partition, it's going to coincide with the Shor function S lambda transpose, right? Because all your it's a partition, all your columns are strictly increasing, and all your rows, oops, all your columns are going to be weakly increasing and all your rows are going to be strictly increasing. That is the content of this slide. So the row strict function is the generating function for tableau of shape alpha, where all the rows increase strictly and all the columns increase weakly, right? So the original, the original one for the S star action, uh, that, that's actually in a 2014 paper of John Campbell and his co-authors. Um, so they don't they don't act, they don't say it in these terms, but they do define this function as the dual to something they call the shin basis of the non-commutative symmetric functions. Um, and I tried to I put in the Hebrew characters and everything, but the shin thing wouldn't come out. And Beamers just said you have too many alphabets or something, so I gave up. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. And the, this extended true function was also obtained in a different way from something called lock polynomials. And I think this comes from Schubert polynomials. Maybe I don't know anything about this. And uh, Dominic Searles constructed a zero Hecke module for them also in a different way. 
but it's the same same module. It ends up being the same module. Okay, so uh, if you write everything in terms of monomial symmetric functions, I just want to show you what you're getting. You're getting all these different generating functions, right? The sure function we know is all columns are strictly increasing, rows are weakly increasing. Uh, the Berg and co-authors function is first column strictly increasing, rows weakly increasing. Uh, ours is first column weakly increasing, rows strictly increasing, etc. So you're getting a whole bunch of uh, generating functions for different kinds of tableau. And the last two are the new ones here. Um, so going back to this post set, there's more that you can pick up from it. So if you look at this magenta post set, so now I want, I'm calling sit star of alpha, the set of tableau where the first column consists of, of the smallest integers. So that's what I tried to do in blue. And what happened was when I did blue and red, I got magenta over here. Um, so they all have one, two, three in the first column. If you reverse the arrows, you get something that's invariant under the original S star action, right? So that's a submodule of the S star action. It's cyclic, it's generated by this thing. I can't show that it's in decomposable. It just, the technical stuff doesn't, doesn't quite apply. Uh, but if you mod out by it, so you get a quotient module that is cyclic and that one I can show is in decomposable. Now, the interesting question is, I don't know what these things mean, you know, from the representation theoretic point of view. I don't know if they're interesting, but we do have nice formulas for their quasi-symmetric characteristic. Okay, so there are two more descent sets that you can, you can play this game with. So I'm going to write them like this. You can say I is a descent if I plus one is strictly below I, or you can say I is a descent if I plus one is weakly above I. Those were the other two combinations. And for both of them, both of them define actions on the set of standard immaculate tableau. And for both of them, um, we have a cyclic module for each of them. And the Frobenius, Frobenius character, the quasi-symmetric characteristics, <laughs> old habits die hard are nice because all four actions, all four actions are captured in the same Hecke poset. And the key fact is that order ideals, again, give you submodules and order filters give you quotient modules. And here are the generating functions for the characteristics. They're different from the ones that I put up before. Uh, so uh, maybe we should just go to whoops, a table right away. So um, the, the big takeaway from all this is that I think we've kind of exhausted all the possibilities for Tableau and their associated zero Hecke modules. So at least we have a unified combinatorial picture here. I mean, one, one thing that that I really had trouble understanding when I was trying to learn this stuff was there were all these variants of Tableau running around and, and I, I just I just had a very hard time putting together a big picture. So this is my attempt to put together part of the picture, right? So um, you have all the possible var variations of what can happen to the first column combined with what can happen to the rows and what can happen to all the columns combined with what can happen to the rows. So we have eight different families of quasi-symmetric functions, right? And they're all different. That's what the fundamental expansion is trying to show you there. Uh, so it's only dual immaculates and row strict dual immaculates that give you basis, bases. If you look at this one, for instance, right here, the what I'm calling A star bar, Sorry, I just didn't know what to call these things. Um, you don't get a basis, it's very easy to see. So what are you requiring? First column is increasing strictly, rows are increasing strictly. This is the generating function for all Tableau like this. You can see pretty quickly, if you write out the monomial expansion that you get a triangular transition matrix, but it usually has zeros on the diagonal. So in other words, the analog of the Koska number K alpha alpha is zero. You can't fill it with things that have re repeats in them. 
So it's not a basis. Okay, and this is my final slide again. It's all eight flavors of Tableau. Um, they are related in pairs by that involution psi, that's uh, the lift of omega in, in the ring of symmetric functions, right? And um, so, so they, they give you quotient modules and they give you submodules. These are the two, the two on the left here, the S star of alpha and the E of alpha were the ones that were known, right? And these are all the ones, the other ones are all the ones that we came up with. And I think I should, so we have papers on the archive and I think I should stop. Thank you very much.